In the terminology of Mercurial, the revisions, the snapshots within a repository are usually known as change sets. So each time you check in your code from the working directory, you're creating a new change set. Each change set is uniquely identified by a change set ID, which is generated as a SHA-1 hash of the content of that revision of that change set. And a SHA-1 hash is 160 bits in length, and so represented as hex is 40 digits long. But because a 40 digit long hex number is pretty ugly, Mercurial will usually display these IDs abbreviated to their first 12 digits. Now, the purpose of these change set IDs is that you have a unique identifier for each change set, which is unique across all repositories. So when this change set gets sent around to different repositories, it can reliably be uniquely identified. As a convenience though, every change set in a repo is also known by a local revision number. These are numbers assigned to the change sets in the order in which they are added to the repository, starting from zero. Just be clear though that these numbers only uniquely identify a change set within that repository. So the change set with local revision number 8 in my repository is not going to necessarily be the same change set with local revision number 8 in any other repository. By convention in Mercurial, the local revision number and the change set ID of a single change set are displayed in this form, with the local revision number first, followed by a colon, then the short form, the 12-digit form of the change set ID. Every change set in Mercurial has a parent, the only exception being the special null change set, which is an empty change set and the parent of the first commit. So here in this diagram, we're representing a repository where we've made three commits, the first with the local revision number zero and a parent of null, the second with a local revision number of one and the parent of local revision zero, and the third having the local revision number two and local revision one is its parent. So we have three successive snapshots of our working directory. So the user of this repository first created their project, they initialized the repository to create it, um, they did a bit of work, they added some files into their project, and then they made their first commit. Then they did some more work, probably adding more files, editing their existing files, and made a second commit. And then did more work, made more changes, and made their third commit. A very important concept in Mercurial is that the working directory is sort of like a pseudo change set itself. It's a change set in waiting that we have yet to commit to the repository. And very importantly, the working directory has a current parent, meaning if we were to then commit the working directory, the new change set would have the same parent, and the working directory's parent would be updated to be the new change set. So the working directory's parent is automatically updated every time you make a new commit, but you can also manually change the parent of the working directory, which is something you will do when you want to create a new branch based on an older revision. So here, for example, we've updated the working directory's parent back to the first change set. And so now if we were to commit, this would create a change set whose parent is that first commit, is local revision zero. What we've done effectively is create a new head and a new tip. And the terminology of Mercurial, a head is a change set with no children, and the tip is the newest head in that repo. It's the head with the highest local revision number. Before this last commit, the repo only had one head, revision two and that also was the tip because it was the only head. When it comes time to merge two branches, we update the working directory to have two parents, not just one. In the working directory, we then go about the business of merging these two versions together into one, and then we can commit our merge as a new chain set, which will have these two parents. And as usual, the working directory itself is updated such that the new chain set is its single parent. One of the most important concepts in Mercurial is that chain sets are immutable, meaning once a chain set is created, it can't be modified, and even more restrictive, you can't even delete chain sets. Once a chain set is in a repository, you don't get rid of it. The general reason for this is that the versions of the files in a chain set are not necessarily stored in whole. Most of the time, most files are stored as diffs based upon the previous version, the versions in the parent of that chain set. And in fact, in that parent, uh, there may not be full copies of the file either. There, there, there are likely just diffs. So when a particular version of a file is retrieved from the repository, it is reconstructed from a bunch of diffs applied to the original version in the original commit. Though actually, in, in some cases, Mercurial will decide that in some later chain set, rather than storing a diff, it makes more sense to store that version of the file in whole for that chain set. So what's stored in a chain set is 
first a manifest of all the files, a, a list of all the files in that particular revision, uh, and then you'll have, uh, for some files in the, in the manifest, you'll have just a, a diff uh, based upon some earlier version, or you'll have a snapshot, which is to say a whole copy of that particular version of that file. And then also in the change set, of course, is stored the parent ID, or IDs if there's two, which is the case when you're merging together two other change sets. And then there are a few other pieces of meta information, like a timestamp of when the change set was created, usually the name and email address of the committer, the person who made the change set, and then also a commit message, just a, a short textual description about that revision supplied by the person who committed it. The first two Mercurial commands we'll look at are init and clone. Init, short for initialization, is used to create a totally new repo, whereas clone is used to create a repo which is a copy of some other existing repo. That is a repo in which all the same chain sets are present. As you'll see, when we clone a repo, the repo from which we are cloning is very often remote. It's somewhere out there on the network. First, though, we'll demonstrate cloning a local repo, a repo which resides in the local file system. So, looking at the command line on my Unix system, I have my user prompt here reading Brian at Ubuntu, that's my username, and then after the colon is the shell's current working directory, and tilde is just shorthand for my home directory, so slash home slash Brian. And for the first command here, I write hg space init space foo. hg is the name of the Mercurial binary, the executable file located in, in my bin directory. hg, remember, is the atomic symbol for Mercury, and the command's called hg, not Mercurial, because hg is much more convenient to write. And the general pattern with the hg command is that the first argument is the name of the subcommand we're invoking. Mercurial has a few dozen subcommands, init and clone are just the first two we'll look at. So here when we write hg init foo, foo is the argument to the init command. Uh, in this case, init is expecting you to specify a directory in which to initialize a new repository. So assuming I didn't already have a directory named foo, hg init will create it, and then in that directory it will create a subdirectory called .hg. And we demonstrate this by listing the content of the foo directory with ls hyphen a foo. Recall that by convention in Unix, Files and directories beginning with a period are considered hidden directories and files, meaning that the LS program doesn't normally uh, list them. So we use the hyphen A option here, which tells LS to list all the contents, uh, even the hidden files and directories. Now, this .hg directory, that is the actual repository. That's where the chain sets and all the other information the repository needs gets stored. The directory foo itself is our working directory for that repository. So later inside foo, we'll be adding files and committing them. So now, having created this repository, in our last command we clone it. We clone it to a directory bar, also in my home directory. And as you can see, once the clone operation finishes, Mercurial prints out two lines on the status of the new repository. So there's a bit of an asymmetry there. When you use clone, it, it prints out some status, but when you use init, it just does so silently without reporting anything. I guess because when you initialize a totally new repository, it's just this, always just this empty .hg directory, so there's never anything to report. To send change sets from one repository to another, we have two commands, push and pull. In a push, you're sending change sets from your repository to some other, whereas in a pull, you're bringing in change sets from some other repository into your own. Pushes and pulls are probably most commonly done between repositories on separate systems, over the network, but it is also possible to push and pull between repositories on the same system. So, for example, with our two repositories, foo and bar, if I want to push from foo to bar, I first change directory into the working directory of the foo repository, because when you perform a push or pull, the repository from which you are pushing or into which you are pulling, that's not specified as an option on the command line, it's taken from the current working directory of the Mercurial process, which is inherited from the shell process. So that's why we change the current working directory of our shell first. So once we're in the directory of the foo repository and we invoke hg push, the only argument we provide specifies the path of the repository to which we are pushing. And pull works the same way. We specify the path to the repository from which we are pulling. Now the push and pull commands are smart in the sense that they will only copy the chain sets that need to be copied. That is those chain sets which the, which the destination repository does not already have. And because we just uh, cloned bar from foo before we invoked this push and pull, 
well, there are no change sets that one has that the other doesn't have. In fact, actually, both of these repositories currently don't have any change sets at all. But the reason it says no change is found is because foo and bar currently have exactly the same set of change sets, which just happens to be no change sets at all. Now, it's important to understand that the idea with pushes and pulls is that we only exchange chain sets between repositories which are related, meaning that one is a clone of the other, either directly or indirectly. If you have repository A, which is cloned from B, which is cloned from C, then A and C are also related, just indirectly. Now, if you do have two unrelated repositories, you can push and pull between them. The problem is just that it just doesn't really make sense. It's not something you generally want to do. In fact, it's something you want to avoid doing on accident because it means polluting a repo with all sorts of change sets not related to your project. And, in fact, the way most people work with Mercurial, it's common for a repo to push and pull exclusively with the repo from which it was cloned. So, with this in mind, when you clone a repository, Mercurial creates a configuration file in the .hg directory called hgrc, which stands for Mercurial Run Commands. Uh, so, for example, in our bar repository, which was cloned from the foo repository, you'll see these two lines, uh, paths, and underneath default equals slash home slash brian slash foo, which is the uh, path to the repository from which this repository was cloned. And the significance of the default path is that if we invoke the push and pull commands without specifying any repo, they will be assumed by default. So I can invoke hg push and it pushes by default to slash home slash brian slash foo. And likewise, hg pull uh, without any argument is pulling by default from slash home slash brian slash foo. So you'll find most of the time when you invoke push and pull, uh, you just write hg push or hg pull. You don't specify any other repo. So now we have the commands init and clone for creating repos and then push and pull for exchanging change sets between them. Uh, but what about actually creating change sets? Well, the primary command for that is commit, as in commit the working directory, create a change set from the current state of the working directory and add that change set to the repo. A critical thing to understand about how commits work though is that the working directory itself, just like a change set, has its own manifest. That is a list of all the files which are included uh, in this change set in waiting, this change set yet to be. So creating new files in our working directory and invoking hg commit is not sufficient to then get those files uh, in a new change set. We actually have to explicitly add them to the manifest of the working directory, and only then will they be included in the next commit. Now, you don't have to do this for every file included in the commit every single time you make a new commit, because the working directory inherits the manifest from its parent change set. So you only need to add the files which are new, the files which are present now in the working directory that weren't present in the parent change set. And lastly, in the course of demonstrating these two commands, we'll use the log command, which lists the change sets of the repo uh, in order of newest first. So the log command doesn't actually do anything, it doesn't modify anything, it's just an informative command. It just reports the current set of change sets in your repo. So again, at the command line, uh, notice we're in the slash bar directory. So we're in the working directory of the bar repo. And we're going to start off by creating a file in that directory called file A uh, with the text content that just reads blah, blah. And we do so with the command echo, which recall is a built-in shell command, which just uh, echoes its arguments to standard output. So blah, blah is being echoed to standard output. And then the greater than sign, if you don't recall, is a, a shell operator which uh, performs redirection. It's redirecting the standard output of the echo command uh, to the file, which is called file A, which is newly created here if it doesn't already exist. And so in the next command, if we invoke ls, it's listing the content of the bar directory, which now has file A. Uh, notice that .hg is not included in the listing here because we didn't specify the hyphen A option. It's still there, it's just not being reported in the output of ls here. And now having created this new file in the working directory, if we try invoking hg commit, we get this error message saying nothing changed. Mercurial won't let us commit unless something has actually changed in our working directory relative to the working directory's parent, which is currently the null change set. The problem here, as I explained, is that the manifest for the working directory is currently empty. There are no files in it. So even though we have an actual file in our working directory, as far as Mercurial can see, it's not supposed to be included in the next commit. We can fix this, though, by invoking hg add. 
And notice uh, here I didn't actually specify which file to add. I just wrote hgadd. And by default, it, hgadd will add all files, all files which aren't currently already in the manifest. So it tells us adding file A, it's now there in the manifest. And if we invoke hgcommit, uh, this time it will work. Though notice when we invoke hgcommit, we have to specify the option hyphen m followed by a string reading our first commit. Uh, that hyphen m argument is the message argument. Uh, when you create a commit, Mercurial very stringently requires you, the committer, to actually provide a commit message so that when someone reads through the log, they can see what these revisions are supposed to be. And obviously, our first commit is not a very helpful message, but in, in practice, you'd have something more meaningful, like uh, here's where we fixed this bug, or here's where we added a new feature, something like that. I highly recommend you get in the practice of really coming up with meaningful commit messages. In any case, so here HG commit succeeds, um, and that creates a new change set consisting of just the file, file A. And, and so if we invoke HG log immediately after, we can see it's reporting, hey, there's this one change set. It has a local revision number zero, and its change set ID is, starts with the 12 digits 7C0BB89B0F71. Um, the tag business we'll talk about uh, much later. Ignore that for now. Um, user is Brian, because that's the name I entered in a config file on my system. So that's the default uh, username every, anytime I make a commit in Mercurial. Uh, on your system, you should enter your name in, in the config file. And then after that, of course, the date, when this change set was created, and the time. And then the summary, that's the commit message. So in this example, hglog is just printing out one change set because that's all we have. We just have the one change set. If we had 300 change sets, hglog would uh, print out all 300 change sets, starting with the last one all the way back to the first one. So just to be absolutely clear about what a repository now looks like, we have this single change set, 7z0bb89b0f71. The working directory now has that change set as its parent, uh, which itself has the null change set as its parent. Now, when it comes time to remove a file from your working directory, if that file was present in the parent change set, you shouldn't just simply delete the file, because then uh, Mercurial will be confused. It will expect to find this file in your working directory that isn't there anymore. Mercurial will consider the file missing. So instead of using just the rm command like you normally do in Unix to delete files, you should use Mercurial's remove command, which will not only delete the file, it will remove it from the working directory's manifest, such that it won't be included in the next commit. When we demonstrate this, we'll use the status command, which shows the status of the working directory. That is, it shows which files have changed relative to the parent of the working directory, which files are set to be added, which are set to be removed, uh, and also which files are missing. That is, which files you've deleted without actually removing them from the manifest. So, resuming our previous example, if we start out by using hgremove to remove file A, that will remove file A from the manifest of the working directory, and also uh, actually delete the file from the working directory. And then in the next command, we create a new file, file B. And then next, in the invocation of ls, the content of the working directory is currently just file B. There's no file A because we just removed it. And now when we invoke hg status, it reports that file A uh, denoted with the R is marked for removal, and file B is denoted with the question mark because there is no file B in the manifest of the parent chain set, nor in the manifest of the current working directory. So Mercurial is not currently tracking this file, as we say. And now when we make a new commit, the, the new chain set doesn't include file A, nor does it include file B. In fact, it's empty. There's no files in its manifest. So in fact, if we now recreate file A, and then invoke hg status, what it reports is that both file A and file B have a question mark because neither is present in the manifest of the working directory nor in the manifest of the parent of the working directory. Be clear about the hg status command that it doesn't list all files in the manifest of the working directory. By default, it only lists those about which there's something interesting to say, like is this file going to be added? Has it been modified since the parent? Uh, is it set to be removed? Is it uh, a, now a missing file denoted with an exclamation mark? That is, is it a file that, according to the working directory manifest, is supposed to be there, but for some reason is not? And question mark, again, basically means not tracked. It's a file which is there in the working directory, but is not being tracked. It's not listed in the manifest of the working directory, nor in the parent change set of the working directory. 
To copy versions of files stored in the repository into your working directory, we have two commands, revert and update, which serve quite different purposes. The revert command is so called because the idea is that you revert some file in your working directory back to its state from an earlier chain set, and it does this by reconstructing the file from the diffs and snapshots actually stored on the repo. And once the version of the file is reconstructed, it's then copied into your working directory. Most commonly, the revert command is used to revert a file back to its state in the parent of the working directory. So in your working directory, you're working on the next version, which you're going to commit, but you make some mistake, you tie yourself up in knots, and you decide, well, I'm just going to scrap these changes and revert this file back to its previous state. So that's how revert is most commonly used, and if you don't specify any particular revision for a file, it will just by default use the revision in the parent. Um, but occasionally it is useful, you can specify some earlier revision, some other revision, and revert the file to that revision instead of necessarily the parent of the working directory. The purpose of the update command is quite different. With update, we're generally bringing the entire working directory in line with some previous revision. We're putting everything in the working directory into the state it was in for a specified change set. And very importantly, the change set to which we are updating, that becomes the parent of the working directory. In fact, this is the primary command by which we modify the parent of the working directory. So anytime we want to go back to an old revision and make a branch off of that revision, we first do an update, then we make our modifications in the working directory and commit. And that change set will be a new head, effectively a new branch in the repo. So for example, if this is the state of our repository and we wanted to create a new branch off of the first commit, well, first we update back to that change set that puts all the files in the working directory back to the state they were in in that first change set, and it also modifies the parent of the working directory now to now be that change set. If we then do our work in the working directory and make another commit, we've effectively created a new head, a new branch. So going back to our example on the command line, remember that we've made a second commit, but the manifest of that commit happened to be empty. There were no files in it and yet our directory contains these two files, file A and file B, so HG status reports them with question marks, meaning that these files aren't being tracked. And if we then attempt to update back to the first commit, which is local revision 0, here the hyphen R argument stands for revision, well, the update doesn't complete. We get this error saying that there's an untracked file in the working directory which differs from the file in the requested revision, and that's file A, because if you recall, in our first commit we had a file A, and so Mercurial is being cautious, because if it's going to update back to that first revision, it's going to need to clobber that file. And because Mercurial knows that this file A, the one we've newly created, uh, isn't in the repository, uh, it may represent work that we don't want to lose. So Mercurial is being cautious here. But assuming that we know, hey, we don't care about that file, it's okay if we clobber it, then we invoke update with the hyphen capital C option, which stands for clean, but what it really means is to, if necessary, clobber any files necessary, even if those files might have work that has not been committed. So the invocation of update here reports that one file has been updated, that is the file A has been clobbered with the version that existed uh, back in the first change set, and if we invoke HD status then it tells us, oh, there's just one file now which is present in the working directory but is not in the manifest of the working directory or in the manifest of the parent. And the parent again here is the original change set, the first change set local revision 0. But as the ls command makes clear, file A and file B are both in the working directory. HG status doesn't report on file A because file A is currently in the precise same state it was found in the parent, in the change set we just updated to. So as far as HG status is concerned, uh, there's nothing to report about it. Now if we then modify file A, and we do so here using the echo command, uh, but with the append redirection operator, which is the two angle brackets that appends blah blah to the end of file A. So we've modified file A, and then we invoke HG status, and HG status tells us, yes, file A is marked with an M because it's been modified since the parent. If we decide we want to discard those changes in file A, we invoke HG revert file A, and that checks out again, it checks out the version of file A found in the parent, um, and then when we invoke HD status, it's not reported anymore because now it's back in the state where it's unchanged since the parent. Notice that when we invoked revert here, we didn't specify which change set we want to revert file A back to. So by default, it assumes that we mean the parent of the working directory, which again is local revision 0. If we wanted some other version of file A, 
we could have specified a different revision with the hyphen R option.